Four things that happened after Jesus died. Number 1. There was an earthquake. There was a response from creation following the death of Jesus. We read that the earth shook and the rocks split. Nature itself was shaken by the death of the Son of God. Matthew states first that the earth trembled and the rocks split. Number 2. The tombs opened. Matthew then records, the tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints, God's people who had fallen asleep in death, were raised. After their resurrection, they came out of the tombs, entered the holy city Jerusalem, and appeared to many. The resurrection of the bodies can only be attributed to the direct action of God, implying he is behind the earthquake. Given the geological features of Palestine, which lies on a significant seismic fault, an earthquake would not be an unusual event. But combined with rocks leading to the opening of tombs, it is another significant testament to Jesus' crucifixion. Another earthquake will soon witness an even more significant divine event, the resurrection of Jesus. Matthew's unique record of these events emphasizes the victory over death that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross accomplishes. Those who were resurrected are literally described as those who had fallen asleep, a common New Testament idiom for someone who has died but whose eternal fate is secure. Like the initial testimony, the supernatural resurrection of these saints' bodies and their appearances in Jerusalem is a striking witness to Jesus' work on the cross and subsequently to his resurrection. The term holy people likely refers to pious figures from the Old Testament, heroes and martyrs of Israel's history selected to miraculously witness these events. Their appearance to people in Jerusalem, is a testimony to the effectiveness of Jesus' work on the cross. This anticipates Paul's teaching about Jesus being the first fruits of the dead. But now as things really are, Christ indeed rose from the dead and became the first fruits, that is, the first to be resurrected with an incorruptible, immortal body, anticipating the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in death. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ's at his coming will be resurrected with incorruptible, immortal bodies. The resurrection of these saints is a prelude to the resurrection all believers can look forward to. Through Jesus' death, a new day has come, a day when death was defeated by death, and the resurrection to eternal life became possible. But note, it was not until after Jesus' resurrection that the occupants of these tombs were raised and entered Jerusalem, where they appeared to many. The Bible does not say whether these resurrected saints died again, or went to heaven with the Lord Jesus. The death of the Son of God shook nature itself. The popular preacher Charles Spurgeon stated that men's hearts did not respond to the dying Redeemer's agonizing cries, but the rocks responded the rocks were split. He did not die for the rocks, yet the rocks were more sensitive than the hearts of men for whom he shed his blood. It is best understood that Matthew intended us to see that the earthquake occurred on the day Jesus was crucified and then on the day he was revealed as risen. The power of new life was so strong that it brought back some of the good people who had died. This is one of the strangest passages in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew does not provide us with much information, and we do not learn about this occurrence from any other source. Number 3, There was darkness over the whole land. Matthew chapter 27 verse 45, Now from the sixth hour, noon, there was darkness over the entire land until the ninth hour. There was a thick, thick darkness over the whole land. Now, the scripture was fulfilled, Amos chapter 8 verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Often, Christ was asked for a sign from heaven, and now they had one, but such that it signified the blindness of their eyes. At this point in the afternoon, it would be noon, and the darkness would continue until the ninth hour, which would be three o'clock. 
This supernatural darkness appeared when the sun was at its brightest. Because the moon was full, it could not have been created by an eclipse, as it cannot interpose between the earth and the sun when it is full. The darkness occurring at such a critical moment can mean several things. First, darkness was associated in antiquity with mourning. Darkness was also associated with the death of great men. Both Gentile and Jewish readers could understand the darkness as a cosmic sign accompanying the death of a king. Moreover, darkness was a sign of God's judgment. Number 4, the soldier overseeing the execution realized he was innocent. Now, the centurion and those with him guarding Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became terribly frightened and filled with awe, and said, truly this was the Son of God. It was the job of a centurion to ensure the crucifixion was carried out correctly and without complications. He was generally in charge of a hundred soldiers at the time of a crucifixion. He was a career soldier whose courage and intelligence helped him rise through the ranks. He would be a soldier of the highest order, he would need to be both cold and efficient to succeed in this position. This man had to follow the orders of his superiors. The scene at Jesus' crucifixion was so remarkable that even a hardened Roman centurion recognized that this was the Son of God. This realization meant that Jesus was innocent of the crime for which he was on the cross. The centurion must have had a mix of emotions, he had just realized that he had overseen the crucifixion of an innocent man. These were not the whispered words of a scared recruit or the trembling words of an easily manipulated conscript. They were the conclusions reached by a seasoned veteran, a man who had watched countless men suffer horrific ends and was responsible for leading them to death. This centurion was well aware of the strong condemnation of the Jewish religious leaders who put Jesus on the cross for blasphemy. His commander-in-chief, Pontius Pilate, had upheld Jesus' condemnation for making this claim. But he rejects the condemnation and declares Jesus' claim. Why? Because the arguments in favor of Christ were overwhelming. Although he undoubtedly had overseen many crucifixions, this execution was different. What did he see? Various scenes from the events of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion combined into a compelling statement. It might have been Jesus' response to the injustice he was forced to endure at the hands of his own countrymen, through arrest and trials. It could have been Jesus' response to the torture he suffered at the hands of the centurion and his men. One could think of the dignity with which Jesus responded to the lynch mob demanding his blood, like a silent sheep before its slaughter. The scripture does not record any response from Jesus to the crowd's cries. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate answered again, then what shall I do with the one you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. But Pilate asked, why? What evil has he done? Yet they shouted all the more, crucify him. So, Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus whipped, handed him over to his soldiers to be crucified. His concern was for their forgiveness, not for his escape. Jesus responding towards the people who rejected him, and the soldiers who crucified him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, watching. But even the rulers scoffed and mocked him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar, and saying sarcastically, If you are really the King of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. As they gambled for Jesus' belongings, Jesus' concern was for their forgiveness, not his escape. 
What a powerful statement Matthew chapter 27 verse 35 to 36, and when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then sitting down, they began to keep watch over him, to guard against any attempt at rescue. If all this did not convince him, he saw something more, the response of creation. Clearly, the centurion was shocked to witness such a dramatic event during Christ's final hours, especially since he had never seen anything like it before. It had an almost immeasurable impact on him. The centurion saw, heard, and felt all the events of Christ's crucifixion and death. As a result, he and his troops were greatly frightened. Even if the centurion, and his group of soldiers had learned to deal with fear, now they were experiencing pure terror. It's this powerful cross and the love demonstrated there that moves hearts, even the hardened, battle-weary heart of a career soldier, from death to life. An old saying goes, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. It was so in the first century, and it is still today. The foot of the cross is where everyone, poor and rich, finds level ground to kneel and embrace the Christ who died for them. Truly this is the Son of God, we hear and believe. The journey must not end there. We should have a passion to know him more deeply. May that same desire burn in our hearts so we can honestly know the one who loved us and gave himself for us. The pulpit commentary reports the tradition that the centurion's name was Longinus and that he became a devout follower of Jesus, preached the gospel, and died as a martyr. This is only tradition. We do not know if this happened, but we do know that truth has a way of clinging to a person's heart. The cross of Jesus has the power to change the individual. The centurion started as a Roman officer overseeing a crucifixion, but ended the day recognizing that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus has already taken the initiative in salvation. Christ died for you, now it's your turn. Jesus gave his life, so that we could have ours back. He died as us so we could live as him. He not only pleased his father but won us as a prize. As humanity's substitute, Jesus suffered the withdrawal of communion from the Father. Terrible as this was, it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. There are others who consider this a myth, or at best, a theological story. These are all unique events that uniformly testify to God's unique acts in human history. They are extraordinary supernatural testimonies, that confirm the truth of the gospel, and the transformative reality of Christ's love. If you enjoyed this message, please share it with your friends and family and subscribe to my channel. May God bless you. Together we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding.